Good evening. My name is Avi Noam Pat. I'm the director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut, where I'm also the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening to our 2023 Kristallnacht commemoration and lecture featuring Professor Ari Yaskovitz, who will be speaking on his new book, Reign of Ash. In a moment, I will introduce Professor Yaskovitz and give him a chance to tell us more about his research. But first, as part of our annual Kristallnacht commemoration, I do want to note that tonight we mark the 85th anniversary of the Kristallnacht pogrom, the November pogrom on November 9th and 10th, the night of the broken glass, when the Nazis and their accomplices destroyed hundreds of synagogues throughout Germany, ransacked thousands of apartments, arrested uh, and sent over 30,000 Jews to concentration camps, and killed uh, at least 100, if not more, uh, Jews that evening. Kristallnacht is noted as a turning point in the Nazi policy towards the Jew and Jews, and indeed was an event that uh, shocked uh, the world at the time and garnered a great deal of news coverage around the world, news coverage which noted with horror the ways in which Jews were being persecuted in Germany, Austria, and Sudetenland, um, but did not necessarily lead to any noticeable change in immigration laws um, at the time to assist the Jewish refugees. I did want to um, make note of a new project uh, that we have just launched at, uh, at the University of Connecticut, which I will share with you in, in one moment, is a um, new website at uh, the University of Connecticut that we've just launched in partnership with our uh, colleagues uh, from Voices of Hope, who are co-sponsors for this uh, evening's uh, lecture. Um, and this new project, which you'll see here, is a website that's called Connecticut Remembers the Holocaust. Uh, you'll see that the, the website, you can access it at ctremembers.org. Uh, and on the website, um, it's a, uh, a virtual exhibit that tells uh, the history of the Holocaust through the eyes of local uh, Connecticut survivors, survivors who resettled here in our community. And among the survivors whose stories are featured on the new uh, Connecticut Remembers the Holocaust website, I'll scroll down here, you can see here is one survivor by the name of Margot Jeremias. And Margot, who was a native of Hoffenheim, a small town in Germany, tells in her testimony of her experience of Kristallnacht on uh, November 10th, 1938, when she was a 12-year-old girl. And so I'm going to play a brief excerpt from her testimony as part of our remembrance of Kristallnacht this evening. Things had gotten so bad, 1936 already, so bad in school that I no longer could go to school. And the Jewish people, could, children couldn't go to school anymore in 36 to the higher learning. So there were Jewish schools that started in Heidelberg there was a school and I went to Heidelberg to school, which meant I had to travel an hour by train one way, each way. In 1938, in the morning of the 10th of November, I woke up and I went to school as usual. As soon as I got into the train, I heard people talking to each other saying, oh, we had such a nice time last night. We demolished the synagogue and we demolished the Jewish homes. I was sitting there fearful that I would not know that I was Jewish. I got to Heidelberg and I heard the shouting and the glass shattering. As I got into the station, killed a Jew. And I mean, I can still hear the glass shattering. That was the most terrible thing you could imagine knowing that it was against me. From that day on, I think I, fear never left me. The SR came, that's the brown shirt. There were six men and 12 SR men came to arrest the men. They walked them through the street to the municipal building 
my father could not go home to say goodbye. And we did not know what was going to be, but he was arrested then and there and sent to Dachau. That time, right away, then we got ID cards. Every male was called Israel. Every female was called Sarah. We had to give away our jewelry, money. We couldn't have any weapons, including a big kitchen knife. And from then on, I couldn't sleep without saying a prayer. Please don't let me be so afraid. On Yom Kippur, we had to give the radios away on, in 39. Uh, no telephone anymore. We became isolated in that sense. They were watching you. They knew when, where you were and where you went at all times. So sure enough, in the morning at 8 o'clock, the SR came and said, you have two hours to pack two suitcases and to be at the municipal building. And you will take food for three days. So the SR stayed in the building to make sure we did not take anything we were not allowed to take and watched over whatever we did. I went to do get some food. One of my former schoolmates ran after me and said, thank God we get rid of you Jews. I will never ever forget that. That somebody I was friendly with could go run after me and say that. Okay, so that's one clip from uh, our, our site, Connecticut Remembers the Holocaust, and again, tells Margot's experiences of Kristallnacht in Heidelberg in 1938, and the sense, you can see the notion of the fear never left me, the degree to which the traumatic events of that night and then what would follow stayed with her and with, with her family. So I wanna thank all of you for being here with us this evening. I think we all note that this year, Kristallnacht, as we commemorate Kristallnacht and the 85th anniversary of the November pogrom, the degree to which it's especially poignant this year as we note just one month after um, the horrible attacks that took place in Israel and the, the loss of life that took place in the continuing conflict, how important it is for us to uh, remember uh, to commemorate and to note these observances and to come together as a community with these types of commemorations. Um, I'm also uh, want to thank you all for joining us this evening for the book talk uh, featuring Professor Ari Yaskovitz. And I want to thank our co-sponsors of this evening's talk, uh, Voices of Hope, um, for their continued support of Holocaust education throughout uh, the state of Connecticut and our Yukon Gladstein Family Human Rights Institute. Thank you uh, to the Dodd Center for Human Rights for your support of Holocaust and genocide education. And of course, tonight's talk is also co-sponsored by the Yukon Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life and uh, the Jewish Book Council of which uh, Professor Ari Yaskowitz's book is uh, part of the series uh, that is being offered this year. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our uh, special guest uh, joining us uh, from, I believe, from Nashville, Tennessee, from Vander Vanderbilt uh, University. Uh, so Professor uh, Ari Yaskowitz is a historian of modern Jewish and European history. He's especially interested in the interplay between Jewish history and transnational minority politics since the Enlightenment. His book, The Modernity of Others, Jewish Anti-Catholicism in Germany and France, published by Stanford University Press in 2014, explores how German and French Jews in the long 19th century defined their own modernity and national belonging by criticizing the intermodern politics of the Catholic Church. The book was a finalist for the Jordan Schnitzer Book Award in 2015. His newest book, Reign of Ash, Roma, Jews, and the Holocaust, published by Princeton University Press this year in 2023, traces the unlikely entanglement of the histories of Jews and Romani throughout the 20th century, focusing on Western and Central Europe, as well as the United States and 
Israel. And this book, Reign of Ash, will be the focus of his lecture this evening. His work has been supported, among others, by the Rosenzweig Minerva Research Center, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the Lady Davis Fellowship Trust, the Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, the American Philosophical Society, the American Society of Learned uh, Societies, the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies, the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Judaic Studies, and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. One final technical note, and then I'll turn it over to Ari. Um, if you have questions uh, for our speaker uh, this evening, you can either use the chat function and we'll take your questions at the end of the lecture, or um, we're a small enough group, you can also raise your hand. Just please use the hand raise function so that I see you, and then I'll be able to unmute you so you can ask your question. So without further ado, I'm delighted to turn the screen over to Professor Ari Yaskovitz. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I, it's, it is, it's an honor to speak to you uh, and to speak to you on this day. Um, I'm the I'm the grandchild of uh, four Holocaust survivors, um, of whom only one actually experienced Kristallnacht. The others lived in countries that would only eventually be conquered by Nazi Germany. Um, um, and I so this is a date certainly of personal significance, and it clearly is a date of significance in the Jewish calendar, which makes me especially happy that you we are making space here to to think broadly about Jews and, and about another group who were persecuted um, at the same time by the Nazis. So what I want to talk about, uh, you know it from the title of my book, are Roma Jews and the Holocaust. So two people tied together by one event. Um, and of the three terms in my subtitle, Roma, Jews, and Holocaust, it is the first, Roma that usually raises most questions for people. Um, it's the name of that, that approximately somewhere between 10 to 12 million people in the world call themselves. Um, uh, they are the largest uh, ethnic minority in, in Europe today. Um, they are people who were historically called uh, gypsies, usually um, in English. Um, there is also another name that I might that might come up when I speak because uh, we're talking about a genocide that takes its course or well, starts really in Germany and in Germany these groups tend to call themselves Sinti. So very often when speaking about Germany, one says Sinti and Roma to indicate that these this is about people who some call themselves Sinti as well as. Eastern European groups that tend to call themselves Roma, and in English we also just say Roma to, to speak about others. Um, I said already they are Europe's largest minority, um, which makes it so surprising, I think, how little we know about them. Um, if you think about what you learned in school, <laughs> if you think about textbooks, if you think about exhibitions, national exhibitions in European countries, if you've visited, um, Roma don't exist, in spite of the fact that they are indeed the continent's largest minority. So my path to, to talking about Roma is through the lens of the relationship with Jews. And I hope it will become clear as I talk why I think that is, is a useful lens um, to think about them. Um, and to really, to, to really ex start explaining that, I want to bring you to a location where actually their memory is central. And it's this location that already came up, in fact, in the short video we saw. It's the city of Heidelberg, where the survivor, uh, whom you just saw in a video, experienced uh, Kristallnacht. This is also the city where an uh, uh, important association of German, Sinti, and Roma created the first permanent exhibition of the Romani Holocaust. Um, it's an exhibition that opened in, uh, in 1997. and if you if you enter that exhibition, there is a statement that you will see, and I'll show you I'll show it to you on on a slide. Um, this is what you will see. Um, the, uh, a big sign that says the genocide against the Sinti and Roma was executed with the same motive of racial hatred, and the same will to systematically and definitively exterminate as a genocide against the Jews. 
Um, now, the sentence itself comes from the German pr president at the time, um, Roman Herzog, um, uh, so in, in the late 90s. Um, the same sentence was discussed as an inscription, in fact, um, for a monument that was built in Berlin to commemorate the murder of Europe, Sinti, and Roma. Um, it was eventually they chose a different inscription. It is also the sign you will see if you go to the memorial grounds on what was the Auschwitz uh, concentration camp. Uh, the exhibit there on Roma and Sinti will have the same sentence. Um, what you can see here is how central the murder of Jews is for people who try to explain what happened to Roma. And obviously this is, it's a one-sided relationship we're talking about. You can, you can get that sense here already. I think it's very hard to imagine um, that there would be any, any equivalent sentence in uh, right, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. You would never enter it and say that um, there, the murder of Jews is was done with the same motive of racial hatred as the murder of Roma, because it would be a way of explaining the lesser known, the, the better known genocide through the lesser known. So we see is an asymmetry. Now, when I say asymmetry, it's actually important to remember that many Jewish survivors will concede and did speak in public and wanted to say in public that Roma suffered like us. This will be sort of the, the gist of what they will be saying. And I think it actually became good form uh, in progressive contexts um, to say, to recognize the Roma also as a forgotten genocide. But what I want to what I want to highlight in that context is that there is a big difference between what Roma say and what Jews say. Because what Jews will very often say is Roma or gypsies, they will say, suffered like us. Whereas Roma will routinely say, we suffered like Jews. And we suffered like them, and they suffered like us. Sounds like the same thing, but it's actually the inverse. We suffered like them is a demand for inclusion, and they suffered like us is a concession that basically reaffirms one's, one's own history as well. So what I'm trying to, what I try to work through uh, in my book, and I want to think about in this talk with you is, is to think through this unequal relationship. Um, what consequences it has for our understanding of Nazi genocides, um, and what it can, what thinking about that can do if we want to rewrite the history of racial, Nazi racial pers uh, persecution in a more inclusive manner. Um, so if we might think just about how we learn about genocides, about these two genocides, this asymmetry really goes to the heart of it. And I want to give you one more example that really deals more with knowledge. That is not just how we frame it, but really how we learn about these two genocides. Um, and the example I want to give you is of the largest archive of testimonies that we have. Um, testimonies pretty much like the one you saw now in the beginning. Um, and the biggest of these institutions is the USC Shoah Foundation, which uh, is an institution created in the 1990s that now has over 50,000 interviews with Jewish survivors and several other groups, but, but Jewish survivors are the, the by far largest group. Within that archive, you also have 406 interviews with Romani survivors. Now that is, a course, a fairly small number compared to the large number of Jewish interviews, but it still is the largest such testimony archive in the world for Roma. So what the result of this is, if you are studying the Romani Holocaust, you have to work with a Jewish archive, basically, or an archive that has been created to commemorate the Jewish genocide. And what I'm trying to figure out too, and what I want to discuss here, and want us to think about is what it really means when one history is made to encompass another history, when one minority group controls, owns a large part of the archives and thus the history of another group, or in other words, which types of responsibilities it actually creates. 
Now, when when you hear the things I've said, uh, I think the what, what often happens is that uh, that we start comparing the events. Um, if we wonder about why things are differently uh, depicted, we very often go back to the event and we try to say, well, you know, what are the dimensions? How, how did these things work out? Um, uh, how essential were were these groups for for the Nazis? Um, and I think. It's a lot of common sense in, in in having these comparisons, and I think comparisons are also how the way we understand the world. Comparisons were actually things that the people at the time did. That is, both Jews and Roma, as they were being persecuted, started comparing themselves to others to understand what's happening to them. But there are also problems with comparisons, especially these sort of grand comparisons. The first one is that it's very hard to decide which types of questions you're supposed to ask because depending on the question you ask it's going to work better for one case or another case um really what makes much more sense is asking questions that allow us to make good arguments i would say but ultimately there's no good way to decide and the way it often actually is set up so if there is no good way to decide why do people ask certain questions and i would say it's very often either knowingly or unknowingly a political decision. And I'll just give you this example, one example of it being very knowingly uh, a political decision. The earliest really institutions to start comparing are German courts. And these are German courts that deal with compensation. And the reason they started comparing what happened to Roma and what happened to Jews was to deny claims by Roma. They basically went down checklists and said, look, this is where people were a star, this, there was no equivalent here. When when exactly did they raise the barbed wire fence? Was it later, was it earlier? They went in the most minute way <laughs> through differences. And the whole point was simply to exclude people. So ultimately what we end up with very often is, is hierarchies, hierarchies of suffering. How do we avoid that? How do we, what? so what, what am I offering if I'm saying comparisons are not good? What I want us to, think about what I want to do is a relational history. What I will be talking about is not a comparison between the two, but how the two groups have actually been interacting with each other, starting with the Holocaust and going all the way until today. So well, let me let me begin at the beginning then. At the beginning, there is no real beginning in a sense um, because uh, these groups had been in Europe for a very long time. But for my purposes, the beginning is the rise of Nazism, which is when the our way of telling the story of these two groups as two victims next to each other, that's when that story really starts. Um, so if you if you look at how Jews and Roma were interacting with each other, uh, at the very beginning of the Nazi, um, of the rise of Nazism, all the way to the beginning of World War II. So basically including the period of, of Kristallnacht, I would say. Um, there was generally a sense of distance between the two groups. Um, so if we're speaking about Germany and then the expanded Germany, Austria, eventually the Sudetenland, um, in general, I would say these two groups had very limited contact with each other and did not recognize each other as being similar. So one way you can see that is that if you were to look at what Jews were writing at the time, you wouldn't know that, it Rome, that it's Roma who actually were the first of these two groups who, who faced internment as a group. Jews actually started facing large... In, internment in large numbers with Kristallnacht. Um, Roma and Sinti were uh, started to be put into municipal camps in, in 1935 and in larger numbers in 1936, uh, around the time of the Berlin Olympics. So starting in Cologne, but eventually in many German cities, Berlin, Frankfurt, Düsseldorf, Essen, Dortmund, Gelsenkirchen, various others. Um, and this was eventually was part of um, you know a, an isolation that allowed the Nazis to well, first manage these populations and eventually aid in their deportation uh, as well. 
Um, when Jews noticed these things, they probably dealt with it like all the other, like many, like many Europeans, like everybody around them. Um, they understood them as extensions of long-standing policies. Arresting so-called gypsies as vagabonds was just business as usual for most people. That wasn't particularly noteworthy. Um, so in contrast to, for example, boycotting Jewish stores, April 1st, 1933, which was much easier recognized as, as a revolutionary act, I would say. Second, most Jews, rightly, would not think they would end up in a so-called gypsy camp on the outskirts of German cities. So um, you can very much understand how, at the time, Jews would see this as a different, different history, just uh, something else that is happening at the same time, and how the first histories written after the war, in part by Jewish survivors, and eventually by others too, and using the voice of, of survivors as sources, how all these histories would actually not see this as part of the chronology of Nazism. Um, and here, and this is actually interesting, it's not helpful to simply turn to the voices of victims. Sometimes that is very helpful for understanding what people are, are feeling. But if we turn to the voices of Jewish victims, we wouldn't hear the Roma here. In general, the voices in oral history interviews and others are limited when we deal with the persecution of groups whose marginalization is just taken for granted, is seen as sort of self-evident. Um, now, if I said these two groups are sort of separated, that does change with the war. And that's when policies massively radicalized, both for Jews and for Roma, um, and they stop being symbols to each other and really start to encounter each other as, as embodied beings. Um, and Nazis did try to separate uh, both groups to some degree. Um, they did try to hide killings as well, but none of this was, was ever complete. So um, to just cite some of the, to, to bring you to some of the sites uh, mentally um, where these interactions are happening, uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau would be one of them. Here, the so-called gypsy camp uh, was right next to the ramp, this famous ramp where selections happened starting in May 1944 in particular with the deportation of Hungarian Jews. Um, and Roma had actually been forced to build the camp, uh, the ramp. Yeah, Jews actually had been forced to build the gypsy camp. Roma had uh, were forced to build the ramp where Jews would be selected. And they would be some of the last victims to be able to see these other victims alive who were then marched to the crematoria. Um, Jewish testimonies are also sometimes the last things we ever know about Romani victims. Um, and here it's not necessarily visual testimony. It's in, in Jewish testimony, it's very often auditory testimony. That is a memory of screams. And this is, for example, the dominant memory of the Jews who were in the who were imprisoned in the lodge ghetto. Um, there was a sub ghetto created for a month and a half um, that was a gypsy ghetto, um, and it contained five thousand Roma deported from Austria, from the Austrian Burgenland. And the memories that most Jews had from this camp was of screams they could not understand, but that were earth shattering. Um, similar memories of Jews uh, about uh, the murder of the over 4,000 Roma, basically the whole, everybody left in the so-called gypsy camp in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau in a single night on August 2nd, 1934. And many Jewish survivors actually report this as one of the worst nights in Auschwitz. Um, and we don't know the Romani side of either of those, actually, because every single person was murdered in Auschwitz, but also in Lodz. Uh, the 5,000 Roma in Lodz, 700 died within weeks because of typhus and, and other diseases. And the whole rest were murdered in Hirno, um very soon afterwards. Um, many of these memories, that they really concerned all the senses, sight, hearing, smell, and even, even tactile, uh, dealing with each other's property, dealing with each other's corpses as well. 
Um, in Chelmno, for example, where these Austrian Roma were murdered, it was Jews who had to bury them. Um, who then, according to the testimony that actually would warn the Warsaw Ghetto that there were killings happening, that mass killings were starting, that testimony reports to us how the Jews forced to bury the Roma in January 1942, in a cold January, then took the clothes of the Roma who were buried there and were subsequently shot on the top of the Roma they had buried. So what you can see is, is, is an physically these these two groups are now in the same place and, and experience some of the same things. Um, the paradox here is perhaps that none of these interactions, and, and some of these obviously are, are incredibly gruesome, um, none of those actually create familiarity. Hearing somebody being murdered, seeing somebody being murdered doesn't make you understand them, doesn't make you know their name. Um, when there were interactions where people actually spoke to each other, those were very often much more traumatic. And the interactions were traumatic because it was because the Nazis set up the conditions where this could be happening. One such place, I'll just mention one most famous one was when Jews from Northern Transylvania were deported to the so-called gypsy camp. And for about two weeks, German Sinti, so German Romanis were their capos, were in charge of them. Um, and the memories are generally of mistreatment by the Roma who were in charge of them. And the most famous person to remember this uh, was actually Elie Wiesel, um, who had this in night, both in Yiddish version and all the later versions. Um, it's his, He has a, a section where his father is beaten up uh, by a Romani capo. And this is it's a crucial turning point in, in his in his memoir, where this makes him realize uh, really how this is a new situation where he has no way of defending himself and defending his father. So it, it, it is the helplessness is is encapsulated precisely in these in this interaction. Um, now, in I should say Jews were actually much more often in charge of managing Roma, and that is simply the case because um, usually Roma ended up in spaces that were first established to detain Jews, and Jews were just more available to manage the others in these circumstances, such as in the large ghetto. So what you can see here already, I said relations, right? This is incredibly complicated and very often incredibly painful, the things that people experienced. So relation, when I say I want to write a history of the relationship between these two groups, or I wrote a history of the relationship, it is not necessarily a relationship that is easy by any means. What we can see here are really three things. Uh, first, when Roma and Jews are interacting with each other, it has nothing to do with central policies from Berlin, nothing to do with ideology. It's really about the immediate decisions made on the ground by some people, availability, practical decisions, um, and grand comparisons, the way we have been doing them, <laughs> thinking about race theory, don't tell us a whole lot about any of this. Um, second, uh, there's this strange inverse relationship between knowledge and solidarity. Solidarity very often came from witnessing what happened to others from a distance. Whereas the people who had the most intimate relations often had the most painful memories and thus found solidarity more complicated very often. And third, um, really the, the, the more productive relationship between Jews and Roma does not come out of the camp simply. It's not that they were built a relationship in the camps that simply continued. Uh, really, what Bill would build up their relationship, what they would share ultimately, is the fight for justice and to repair the injustice. And this is really where their ties will be created. So let, let me turn to that post-war period when precisely that is happening. Um, and when they, they are indeed liberated, when they survive in whatever way they survive, hiding in, in camps uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in other countries, um, they're, they're, 
many of the similarities, but many of the differences will really also be will will be will will come out again between the two groups. And to to just speak about this, I want to just show you a document that I personally found um, found incredibly fascinating, and and that I think encapsulates a lot of that those relations. And it's it's a document that I found um, in the archives of the Jewish community. Um, and you can see it here. Um, it's a peculiar document. Um, it was created by a Jewish institution, pretty much. It was not the, the Jewish community itself, but it's something called the Action Committee, which was an institution created by the Jewish community to help Jewish survivors. Uh, and they held lists because this is an age of lists as well. Um, they had lists with ch children of school age who were in concentration camps, stateless Jews who got U.S. food distribution help. There was a list of prisoners who spent three, between three and three and a half years in a concentration camp. Um, that's the list right next to it. And it's a list that has my grandmother on it, actually, who was deported from Vienna and returned to Vienna after the war. And right next to that list with my grandmother on it, all these other lists about Jews is this list of circle gypsies. So the Jewish community here held a list of gypsies registered with us. Um, and it's a list of three, 33 Romani men and women. Um, and I can tell you more actually about two of them, uh, Adolf Gosap and Hermine Horvat. Um, perhaps also give you a sense of, of what, what these people experienced when they registered here with this Jewish institution. Um, so Adolf Gusak, um, both of these people actually lost everything pretty much. Um, Adolf Gusak um, lost his wife and son um, in the camps. Uh, Horvat uh, lost her parents and four siblings in the camps. Um, they eventually got together after the war, having lost everything. Uh, Gusak also didn't return too much. Uh, he had been was an orphan to begin with, raised by a priest and never owned property. Horvat's family did own property, a really tiny house and a vineyard in the Austrian province of Burgenland. They never got anything back. That was also an absolutely typical experience. Though their neighbors just kept their property after the war. So after they're liberated, um, they, um, they come together. And in the summer of 1946, they will sign up with the Jewish community. And they do this in a situation where people like them have incredible problems just registering as victims because the people who are in charge of the victim lists that are officially recognizing people as victims are largely political victims of the Nazis. And they have a very high standard. They have an idea of hero heroism and, a, and of pure victimhood. They will eventually begrudgingly include Jews in those lists. They will include a lot of people who in their mind are not worthy. And that includes anybody who was deemed asocial, work shy, inclined towards criminality, or, and there is the suspicion, who was a gypsy, who was deemed a gypsy, and that implied a lot of precisely these other things for them. So Jewish institutions here were actually more welcoming. And if you look at the way this bureaucratic process worked, one can see that it, the Jewish community is much more willing to accept these people um, as fellow victims. Um, and when, if you think about Roma and Jews here in this context, we can see that they, they do have certain things in common that others victims had in common. So one thing they had in common is they were liberated and uh, they, uh, they really wanted to find their family. The first thing most of the survivors are looking for are, are family members. Um, and the other thing that they both face are uh, neighbors who are not welcoming to them. That is, they return and anti-Semitism didn't go away and anti-Roma sentiment did not, did not go away either. No, neither, when they return, neither, <laughs> neither group is welcomed back really. But there are also these very big differences. When Roma survivors are trying to find relatives, are trying to rebuild their lives, they are working with kinship networks. Jews do that as far as they can as well. Whoever is left, they, 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 you know, they ask other survivors what happened to relatives. 
but they also have Jewish institutions to help them. And that is the big difference because Jewish aid organizations are absolutely essential. And actually it's the US that is central here in particular, it's the American Joint Distribution Committee, the, the, the joint uh, founded in 1914 already to help uh, Jews during World War I, which will be absolutely essential in providing food and providing all sorts of access uh, for Jews. Um, so Roma are really trying to access precisely these resources when they're signing up with, with Jewish communities. Um, and I have an interesting testimony of one person who, a, a Romani woman who says they pretended to be Jews, were with fake IDs in the Jewish TP camps and, and really liked the Yiddish theater. Um, uh, so uh, you, you can see a new type of connection being brought up here. The other thing they really needed um, is documentation. And this is what these lists do too. This is why there are these lists, because these lists are essential for making claims. So just to illustrate um, how hard it was for Roma to really establish their history, let me tell you about a book. And this is a bit strange because I'm gonna tell you about a book that was never written. And the book that was never written was written by a concrete author. Um, and that author's name was Gerald Reitlinger. So Gerald Reitlinger was a historian. And he had been actually one of the first people to write about the Jewish Holocaust. He wrote, published a book in 1953 called The Final Solution, which was really pioneering. It was, it drew on records of the Nuremberg trials, and it was the book that everybody, all the prosecutors in Germany, when they wanted to, to you know, convict, get, get a conviction for a, for, for a Nazi criminal, these, that was the book they were actually sending each other. Um, he published several other books on, on similar topics, on the SS, for example. Um, and uh, he had a publisher uh, for these later books, uh, was an Austrian Jewish emigre by the name of George Weidenfeld, later Lord Weidenfeld. Um, and Lord Weidenfeld was somebody who was also deeply interested in these topics. He was, he was from personal history, too. He also had a lot of money uh, in the late 1950s because he made a very smart decision to publish a book called Lolita by Nabokov, which was prohibited in the US, which is the best advertisement there is in the world for a book, as you may know. Um, so he had resources and he told one of his favorite authors, Reitlinger, why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book about the Romani genocide? Nobody has done that. You're a specialist, you already wrote about Jews. We know this other group has been murdered. Nothing has ever been published about it. Why didn't you write a book about it? So what, what does an author do? What does, uh, actually he was a, he, he wasn't even a proper historian, I should say, right, Linger. He was actually an art historian, um, a peculiar one. Uh, but so what, what does a person do who has written historical books and wants to find out about these things? There are several things he could do. There are people who are dealing with so-called Roma, uh, with the so-called gypsies. Uh, the Gypsy Lore Society was a famous one in Liverpool. They were sort of the specialists on Roma, sort of anthropologists, if you want. They didn't have an ar archive. They couldn't really help him. Um, and the other thing he could really do um, was to write to survivor associations. And he wrote to one of the biggest ones, to the head, to the secretary of one of the biggest ones, the International Auschwitz Committee to a man by the name of Langbein, who was also George, we who also worked with George Weidenfeld. So the, the editor is putting people together here. Um, and he, Reitlinger asked Langbein to please help him find material on the Romani genocide. And this is from their, uh, this is a short exchange from, what, from, from their letters because Mr. Langbein from Vienna tells Mr. Reitlinger in, in England that responding to your letter, I have to repeat that currently material about the fate of the gypsies in Auschwitz is not available in a collection. And Reitlinger reacts by saying, well, if it's not in a collection, I'm not writing a book, um, which really upsets uh, Langbein, who actually seems to then writes to um, George Weidenfeld. Reitlinger seems to have expected that I would have sources all collected and ready for him. Um, this might, of course, be a secret about how historians work. We rely on the work of, of others to collect our materials very often, uh, including civil service, 
servants. And this is clearly what, what Reitlinger had hoped for. Um, the reason Langbein was upset is not just that he thought Reitlinger was lazy. It's rather because he understood what it would have meant for Roma. He worked with a lot of Austrian Roma who were trying to make claims, whose claims were denied by the state. He understood what it would have meant if they, like Jews, in courts, could point to a book and say, no, no, this really happened. There is somebody established here who can prove that. Um, and all of this eventually did change. There were people who would slowly write, collect information material, would create precisely the archives that Reitlinger needed. And again, it was Jewish archives that would eventually do that work. And I just want to mention one of them here, which is the Wiener Library in London which was the first to really connect generally victim testimonies. It's the oldest Holocaust library, in, the oldest Holocaust documentation center in the world. They actually started collecting victim testimonies in 1938, Kristallnacht. They have a massive collection of testimonies from Kristallnacht. From the collected in 1938 already. Um, they had also a visionary person running their program on testimonies and research program generally, German Jewish emigre again, Eva Reichmann. And she um, started a program asking her connections in Vienna again to please get testimonies from gypsies, as she said. Um, so what we're seeing is a Jewish archive, a Jewish survivor herself starting to ask for these testimonies. Uh, here is one of those testimonies, and it is actually the testimony of Adolf Kusak, the person whom I introduced to you before from that list, from that Viennese list, whose life I introduced to you very briefly. The only reason I know something about his life from a list is because a Jewish archive ended up paying 250 shillings, so $150, to interview that person in 1958. And I should say the reason I added how much is paid here is not because I, and it might sound cynical, why I have amounts there? It's to remind us that documentation work needs funds, needs resources. And it's precisely that which Roma were missing. Um, the Wiener Library actually had this program thanks to the Claims Conference, which had an incredibly complicated construction to get the money via Yad Vashem. But ultimately, it needed it needed donors. It needed, in the case of Wiener Library, lots of small-scale donors, lots of survivors actually uh, su sustaining the institution. Um, it needed all that for us to, to be able to know um, to know the story of these Romani survivors. So um, many other Jewish institutions would follow this. I won't go into any details. I'm happy to speak more about others who followed in that path, historians, Jewish archivists, who would really make the Romani Holocaust available to us. So you can see that example I gave in the very beginning is at the end of a very long history of Jewish institutions actually doing this work. At this point, I should say two things uh, are striking to me. Um, the first thing is, uh, you would think that uh, it would be 1968ers and the new left that would really care about the most one of the most marginalized groups in Europe, but the people who really do this type of work are Jewish survivors, and they're not the people who are politically motivated originally. The second is that not all of the people who would do this will be actually self-identified Jews. Some would call themselves communists. Um, they're, they're actually fairly diverse bunch. One of the most important is actually Simon Wiesenthal, who was on the political right, both in Europe and in Israel. So the sort of Cherut Likud and Christian Democrats in Europe. He was, and he was deeply invested in that. Some of them, he would clearly identify as strongly Jewish. Others would not, including people who were his close friends. But they all worked with these Jewish networks to make these things happen. And eventually, the very first book to be published on the Romani Holocaust, like a big book on it, was actually funded partially by the Wiener Library and written by a, a communist who was actually of Jewish background <laughs> um, and, and a Romney activist, uh, Donald Kendrick and Grattan Puxen, um, uh, or an activist 
working for Roma. Um, and in 1972, they published The Destiny of Europe's Gypsies. So that all of this, so it's, it was Jewish institutions that from the very beginning really reconstructed this. So I want to jump all the way till today. We, this was the 1950s. These Precisely these dynamics continued. Um, I would say a lot of the asymmetries have stayed that we are seeing that I'm describing. And you, you can see how I'm dealing with asymmetries here. I think there's something right, there is there's the there responsibilities that come with it, but also there, 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 there's something to be celebrated about the people who were involved precisely in these activities. But I would say over the past two decades, things have actually really changed. And what has changed among other things, is that there is a new generation of Romani scholars and intellectuals who are, so I would say generally in the late, late 1970s already, you have a strong civil rights movement of the Roma who get involved in this work. But especially with the newer generation, I would say when it comes to Jews and Roma, what was a discussion that first didn't involve many Roma and it was just Jews talking among each other about Roma, became a discussion then in the 70s, 80s, among very individual figures, so a few people talking, is now a much broader discussion. Um, many of these young Jewish and Romani activists, young, young intellectuals, have very similar paths to be professionalized. They, they, they go through the same internships, uh, unpaid internships. Uh, they have the very similar ways of understanding each other. And you can start to see it really in the way also they will express um, solidarity with each other. Um, and I'll just give you one example here. Um, so on the left, what you have is a Romani group, uh, the largest Romani youth movement, Ternipe, um, which uh, one year after uh, an awful terror attack, a uh, right-wing terror attack in against the synagogue in uh, the German city of Halle commemorates with Jews the um, that attack and expresses its solidarity. We stand together opposing anti-Semitism and racism. And this was in 2020. And just briefly afterwards, the Jewish students of Germany were lighting candles for Hanukkah for one cause. So each candle in Hanukkah was one cause. And one of the causes was for Roma and Sinti. This is a the text here is, is so a gender neutral version, which is relevant in German, um, but it's for Roma and Sinti, um, where they express solidarity with them. Um, and eventually there was even a joint statement by the European Union of Jewish Students and the Romani organization Pira Nomenica, which was about COVID and access to human rights, uh, to, 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 um, to uh, medical, medical services with the sentence, join us standing in solidarity with Roma in times of crisis. Jewish rights are Roma rights and Roma rights are Jewish rights. And if you just consider where I just where I started us off, the two groups not recognizing each other, the beginning of persecution, having very complicated in, interactions during the Holocaust that, that marked the victims. I mean, some, some of them did create solidarity, but that were still very complicated. You can see how far this conversation has really come um, from 1933 uh, to the present. Um, and what I, what I, so what, what do I hope we can get out of this? I think I would like us to, to, to think together about, about, about alliances, about, about recognition, um, about the role that Jewish institutions have, and actually Jewish here. I mean, this I'm speaking at a, a, a center for Jewish studies about Roma. The 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 role that that centers like like your center um, have in in speaking about that that history that has been marginalized, um, and ultimately, I would say that it's. The story I'm telling is actually a, an optimistic story, oddly. Um, it's a story about, about alliances that are possible. Um, my own book is a result precisely of the conversations that have been happening between Jews and Roma. I've profited from these conversations. Um, my book could not have been written without them and, and without the help also of Romani activists, I would say. Um, and finally, I, I think 
it's it's just a general call to make us wonder about our responsibilities to recognize the suffering of others, our responsibilities towards each other's histories, and an opportunity to rethink what it means to have unequal alliances. Um, and, to, and to also to think about the resources we need to forge them. And all that in a context where really there are no other alliances. There are only unequal alliances. And what I hope we can do is use this example to precisely think about those. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Ari, for a fascinating and really enlightening lecture that I think uh, shed a lot of light on a new topic for many of us. So I, I appreciate your joining us this evening to uh, to teach us a little bit more about this history and this shared history. Um, I want to open uh, the floor to the audience. If you have questions, please feel free to use the hand raise uh, function or the chat. Um, I'll start with one question, Ari, and then I'll, I'll turn over to questions that are that are coming from the audience. I'm just curious if you can give us um, a little bit more background on on the shape of the community, both the Sinti in, in Germany and the Romani more broadly in Europe um, before the war, um, and then uh, how it attempts to the community attempts or community as it exists. It sort of tells maybe a little bit about the communal structure as it exists reorganizes in the aftermath of the war and what the obstacles are to, to reorganization. Um, so generally, let me say that Roman city are an incredibly diverse group. They, in terms of religion, they have the religions of their neighbors very largely. That means uh, Catholic and Catholic areas, Protestant and Protestant areas tends to be more, more, more Catholic usually. Um, uh, Muslims in uh, the areas where in Turkey, for example, and and other places in Southeastern Europe, um, and Orthodox Christians in Eastern Europe, uh, they uh, they speak. Uh, many of them speak a language called Romani, which can unite them. Uh, some groups don't actually speak that language. Um, they are more recently, I think, united by a stronger sense of a shared ethnic heritage and a shared history of migration from India in the Middle Ages. Um, they also, historically, the self-organization works within subgroups, I would say. And these subgroups don't necessarily, they have an awareness of each other, but for example, they don't necessarily intermarry, which tells you some, so, so the interwar period already sees first attempts at self-organization. You have Roman unions, there's a, there's a Roman, there's a sort of a gypsy mus musicians union in, in Hungary, for example. Um, Yugoslavia, various states have have some attempts of self-organization, but it's not international. They're small. They're not. They they don't work out very well. I would say, from what I can tell, they don't cover on many people. They're very different from the Jewish community in that sense. The post-war period, eventually, by the 1950s, 60s, sees really the first attempts at international self-organization. And there are always two models. One is the uh, sort of decolonizing world. But for Roma, really, the model was very often Jews, including Zionism, which fascinates many of the figures, especially when they turn to evangelical Christianity, which some of them do. Um, and uh, so as far as so so there there are no communal structures in part because the, that 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 would match Jews so the Jewish communal structures are really also intermediary bodies between Jews and the state um they are never just bodies for the Jews i mean that exists too you know there 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 is a form of self organization of you know a shtibel a small synagogue where people are okay or they're, they're, they are internal, right? The the um, the sort of for burials. But really, if you're talking about the community, um, they they have a particular structure through the interaction with the state. And eventually, Jews, of course, have much more self-organization than a community, right? The Jewish parties, um, right? Bundists live in multiple countries. <laughs> uh, there are um, th so there's there's political organization across countries. Um, you have the big philanthropic organization, there is no equivalent for Roma. When they, in Germany, for example, there's 
central organization will become the Central Council of German Sinti and Roma, which takes its name from the Central Council of German of, of Jews in Germany. Um, so it, even the names are, is, mirror it. Um, and until today, I would say there is no similarly. I mean, Jews are decentralized too. It's not. It doesn't work like Catholic Church in terms of hierarchy. Um, but uh, but at the same time, I would say that there there are profounder differences, and di there's a profounder diversity within the Romani community. Um, so uh, the it's it's just fascinating when one moves between subjects and fields, right? I'm I'm not just didn't just grow up as a Jew. I'm study Jews, um, and and you think well. You know, there, there are conflicts within, you know, questions about who is a Jew, et cetera. And Jewish history might be people doing Jewish history might wonder who counts as a Jew, who doesn't count as a Jew, once they deny their Judaism. But really, those pale, those those issues pale compared to the challenges of writing the history of communities that that really were did not have that cohesion in general. Um, so that's just, just I hope that that answers the question. Yeah. Very, very interesting. We've had a, a, it's really fascinating. A few more questions have come in. Um, Ruth, I'm gonna uh, ask you to unmute if you can do that to ask your question. I have a very different type of personal story. My daughter is a Slavic Yiddish singer who was on tour in the Balkans in Bulgaria where she met a backup Romani musician whose music is very similar to Klezmer. Uh, they became very close. They're both activists. They continue to tour. Mm -hmm. And they eventually married without telling their mother. Eventually, I found <laughs> out. Because he's a Muslim. And mm -hmm. he was brought up Jewish. Um, but they've become very active in California, especially in Berkeley, on telling about Holocaust divisions in Bulgaria by the king who accepted some Jews who were native to Bulgaria, yeah. but not those who are seeking refuge and fleeing from persecution. Though in my family, the Holocaust um, memories, are, there are no living survivors. And his family, he does not know names of people who suffered, but both of them continue to perform the music of their ethnicities. Do you find a lot of this going on in the world? Yeah, so there are two things. One is the music. One is the the other is the history. And Bulgaria is 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 complicated, and and these histories of these countries have often not been written for the Romani Holocaust. So it's very hard. It's it's interesting how for per, how how personal histories and recognized histories interact. Right when we when we tell stories to others, I mean people have their personal memories, but even to convey them to the next generation, tell them to kids, children, grandchildren, it makes such a difference if it's. Just a story that's out there and you can say this is the larger story you already know but my story is versus just not having a story when it comes to music so this is i i said jews and roma don't interact or in, in some i made the very broad statement that that these in these communities don't always interact which is not true for some regions in some places um when it comes to klezmer music there was a klezmer revival Right, there was also rediscovery of klezmer among Jews. Right, it was the, the first generation might listen to some things. The next generation really didn't want it. The next generation is really rediscovering it. That's that's usually very huge in right. Poland, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when they went back, I spoke to some uh, some of the people involved in that, um, and one of them was at a Romani history conference because he said when he went back to Moldova and places like that to actually reconstruct what the the music that has been lost. They talked to Romani musicians because they would often not just play the same music, they would be in the same bands <laughs> or they would both do similar music, which is wedding music, ultimately. It's yes. music for hire. Mm -hmm. um, and they would do similar things. Actually, the very first image that I know of, which a colleague from Hebrew University sent me, is from the mid 18th century from Slovakia which is about getting uh, sort of tricking soldiers into signing up, conscripting uh, for the uh, for the Habsburg army. And it has images of prostitutes there, which is one way to convince them. And the other is music. And they have a group of Jews playing music and a group of gypsies, Roma playing music on that on that tapestry. 
Um, so the that interaction is certainly there, I would say. Um, and and I know that so so and so it's it's both historical to some degree, I would say, and it's a revived tradition as well. Um, I think what what I've been struggling with is that this is I think it's a real history that is out there. But for in some places, at least, it's an overemphasized history because it's a, it's one that one, one can celebrate. There's something incredibly happy about it. And what I discovered looking at so many sort of the broader experience of both people is that not all the interactions were actually that happy. Well, I'm, there I'm, is I'm, the stone at Treblinka that says Bulgaria on it. And I don't know if the Romani in Bulgaria were as persecuted as the Jews who were fleeing into Bulgaria, who were all deported. Right, right. right. And, and, the, and, and, and of course, uh, Bulgaria also occupied a part of Macedonia, right. where deported all, all Jews. And I've, I've, I've known historians who are trying to reconstruct these things for Roma, and that's not so easy. Bulgaria did generally not mm -hmm. persecute Roma. Same same principle, basically. That's not so clear about the areas it occupied um, uh, during World War II. Um, but I I'm not sure the the that history is is fully written uh, actually to, to 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 the best of my knowledge. Um, and it's so surprising very it. often yeah. how many basic things are still being reconstructed when it comes to the to the Romani genocide, I would say, especially in these regions. Thank you. Um, I see we have a few more questions that have come in, so I'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, from Bonnie um, asks, and Bonnie, if you want to add to it, just let me know. Uh, Bonnie asked, to what extent has language figured in relationships between Jews and Roma? And if I can add to that question, because I'm also very interested in this in this language question, is how much does uh, sort of the the lack of um, understanding of the Romani language outside of the community um, hinder knowledge of the broader history and the testimonies that you viewed at the Shoah Foundation are those what languages are those in? So anyway, first Bonnie's question and then more broadly on, no, they're, on language. they're all connected. Yeah. They're, they're 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 very closely connected. Um, so when it comes to to people actually interacting with each other, Roma much like like most Jews would, I mean, well, I mean, Jews, it's, it's, it's again, there's a diversity there. It depends on which communities we're actually talking about. Um, if we're talking about the communities where they would interact most, which would be Hungary, Romania, um, Yugoslavia, um, I would say most Jews speak local language, one of the local languages. Um, I mean, there's a there are interactions also in the largely Yiddish speaking uh, parts of, of, of Europe, I would say. Um, generally, Roma would speak a language, not every single Romani person will have to speak also a non-Romani, not just Romani, uh, to survive uh, economically. This is just the, the whole the, the, the patterns here. And I'm wondering, I should actually have said originally when I was asked about explain things about, about the Romani community and how it's structured is, I think we have the, the image we have in the US very strongly is of people who are itinerant, who are nomadic, um, which is true of some Romani communities, especially in the UK, um, some in the United States as well, um, and in partially in Western Europe, the further you go to Eastern Europe, and the, uh, they tend to be settled. And sometimes on uh, the outskirts of cities, uh, so marginalized in different ways, uh, but but not not itinerant. So the majority, even even in the early 20th century, the majority of Roma would have been settled and would speak the languages also of their environment. When it comes to, uh, so so there would should be actually easy ways of interacting with each other. And of course, when there is solidarity between Roma and, 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 and Jews, um, that can come through shared language too, say, a Viennese, a Roma, a Rome from Vienna meets a Viennese Jew in a camp, and they both speak Viennese German. I mean, that can create a connection as well. Um, so, right, there, there are many more dimensions of just being Romani or just being Jewish, obviously, um, that, that can bring people together. And language can be that. Um, when it comes to, I mean, so I, I, I tried, I, I learned some Romani for the project, but ultimately there are a few sources in Romani. My Romani is not good enough to listen to interviews, 
by, by any means. Um, it, but in general, I would say, so the, the Shoah Foundation testimonies are in mostly in, in various, uh, they're Polish, uh, in uh, Ukrainian, uh, in, in, in various languages, um, uh, Serbian, uh, uh, as well, the Fortune of Archive too. The Fortune of Archive has a large one in large collection in German, in fact. Um, uh, so it wasn't that useful um, to learn <laughs> to learn Romani for that purpose. Even though it, it would be, it is per, it it, would, it does make a difference if people are members of a community and really speak Romani fluently and and can enter communities and, and have very different conversations. Just as a historian. Coming in from the outside, I, I, I've, I've, it, it hasn't been as, as, as useful for me. Um, so, I, I think language doesn't need to divide these these communities necessarily, in in that sense. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, there's another uh, question from uh, Riley Coleman who asks: Are there Roma in the U.S.? How when did they get here? And and tell us something about the nature of the community in the United States today. Sure. Um, so Roma, one, one thing that is fascinating with Roma in the U.S. is their invisibility in a country that ha celebrates hyphenated identities. Um, and the invisibility tells you something about what it means to say that you are a so-called gypsy, which usually is not to anybody's benefit. So even though, you know, mentioning that you're a member of an otherwise not recognized if you can pass and you don't have to be a member of a minority, it's sometimes for many groups, including Jews, some maybe there, there are places where you don't want to highlight your Jewishness historically. But that's not true across the board, right? And there are urban centers when Jews arrived, right, the Lower East Side, where you, you would have whole parts of town that are identified with a particular ethnicity, right? There's German towns all over the U.S. There are the Chinatown, Little Italy, etc. There is nothing equivalent for Roma. When Roma mentioned they are, so, and one of the people you would call gypsies, usually it just leads to suspicion. You know, anything, it, it, it leads to bullying in school. Learning early on that this is not something, many, many Roma learn very early on that this is not something that you will ever say, that, that, that you know, is that you would show in public. Um, so we don't have statistics really that are good about Roma. Um, uh, there are estimates of a million. Um, I, I I can't check those, to be honest. Um, I've heard higher ones too, but again, I have, I have no no way of of, of 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 confirming those. When it comes to where they come from, it's very similar to to other migration movements. They come when their neighbors come. So the from from the UK, the Romani shells, they will come say 1840s, 1850s. Uh, then uh, there are groups that come from uh, Kaldarash uh, that will come, some Romanian groups, uh, Serbian groups um, that will come, uh, say, 1880s. Um, uh, there will be people come from Yugoslavia, like sort of the, the same is true also in, in other places, I should say, and like guest worker migration in Europe, right? This Turkish and, and, and in this case. Yugoslav groups that come to Germany, Austria in the 1970s, 1980s. Many of this will also include Roma, um, basically traveling with with their neighbors. So um, uh, those, so so that that will be the. And and you have you have distinct communities. So the New York in the in the Bronx, there is a Muslim, Romani community from uh, from Macedonia. Um, there are these these particular other groups that tend to be more in California, et cetera. So, but but there is what would it is a peculiar history in the U.S. And again, there, the fascinating thing is, if we know something about Romani history, actually the Holocaust is the thing we know most about. All other parts of Romani history are even less discussed, and there is barely anybody in the U.S. who has ever really seriously worked on them as a historian. I have one wonderful colleague who does sort of uh, colonial America, who is who, who is now working on them, but it's an absolute exception. Um, so what we usually what what I know and what we know is usually comes from anthropologists who are studying a current community, 
describing one community they engage with, live with, um, but that is not a larger history of, say, migration, um, how they enter, how they're how they they how they're marked um, in the U.S. Um, right uh, in, in in these big divisions of U.S. history um, as white and black and and, and the, the things that structure U.S. history. We 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 don't have a, a full story here. Yeah, which also says suggests how important it is the history that you've written to shed some light on the on this history as well. Um, we'll take one one last question um, and make it our final question. This is uh, from from Bonnie, um, who asks, and I suspect it's related to the point that you just made about the lack of a history. Uh, to what extent, Bonnie asks, is there a Roma literary tradition? And is there any written documentation by Roma about their Holocaust experience? I mean, it's a, historically, it tends to be more of an oral culture. Um, and some of the first written documents are uh, come out of that oral tradition, including poems that are, are also songs. Um, uh, uh, the... Um, there is a, there is a, there are eventually, there are Romani writers, um, uh, especially I would say in Eastern Europe, um, who, who start to, to write, uh, to write about history, um, uh, uh, writers who write also fictionalized accounts, uh, right, so novelists, um, or novellas, or in such, such work, um, there, so there, there is in that sense, uh, a literary tradition that one one could by now create a, a canon, I would say, of of Romani authors. Uh, I write about one of them because one of the Matteo Maximov, who writes a book in France that is very successful in 1946, and he's somebody who demands a, a sort of Nuremberg style international tribunal for the Roma. Um, so so there are some some figures like that. Um, I, th I think their recognition is 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 is, is sometimes is slow in coming, or they they they. I mean, we also or they they were they actually were prominent and are forgotten then. Um, again, in at least internationally, um, so yes, I th I think one one can work on 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 Romani writers. It is, however, it's not just one tradition in one language. So the challenge for anybody writing about this is that well. Matthew Maximov wrote in French. Um, Maynard Lakatos wrote in Hungarian. Um, I mean, there's there it it is a it is a multilingual world really um, that they write in. Um, there's a famous poet Papuja who writes in uh, Polish. Or, well, first in in Romani and is translated into, into Polish. Um, uh, um, and and that's that's how her work is known. Um, so it's, it's also something I struggled with, I should say, as a, as a, as a historian, we all have our linguistic limitation limitations and, and, and it is a, it is a field where you, you definitely need help. Um, I think anybody, <laughs> who, um, no, nobody speaks all languages of the world and, and everybody needs, uh, needs help to, to, to really grasp it and as, and just as a larger story. Great. Well, thank you so much. Ari, for, for joining us this evening. I'll invite the, the audience. We'll do a virtual round of applause. Um, and uh, thank you for, for sharing this history with us and for taking on um, this incredibly important project to uh, give us a sense for the shared history and then the shared memory uh, project that uh, develops between uh, Roma Jews and, and the Holocaust. I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening for our 2023 Kristallnacht lecture. And I want to thank our co-sponsors uh, from the Jewish Book Council, from Voices of Hope, uh, from the uh, Yukon Gladstein Family Human Rights Institute for uh, co-sponsoring uh, this evening's program. Thank you again, uh, Ari, and uh, I wish everyone the best and uh, let us hope for brighter days ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.